views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Are you ready to stop stress, anxiety, and low self-esteem from running your life? Join award-winning author Dr. Friedemann Schaub from Empowerment Radio as he addresses some of the most prevailing challenges in our day-to-day lives. Find out how you can use the power of your mind to overcome self-sabotaging patterns and build a solid foundation of confidence and self-respect. Learn cutting-edge tools and approach every day with great ease, joy, and purpose. This is the time to empower yourself. Now, here's your host, Dr. Friedemann Schaub. Welcome to Empowerment Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Friedman, and today we are talking about something that all of us, I think, are interested in, all of us have done before, all of us continue to do throughout our entire lives, and at the same time, it's one of the greatest mysteries in life, and it's so interesting and curious for my guest today to explain more about that such important and also healing topic that we want to address, which is our dreams. Now, we all dream, and I think we all know that our dreams have a certain meaning. Sometimes it's confusing what it means. Sometimes it's something that we pay attention to. Often people tell me, I have no idea what I'm dreaming. I haven't dreamt in years, which is not true. We all dream every night. We just are not always aware of it. Why? One of those questions I want to ask our expert today. But another thing that about dreams that I think is a lost art is that dreams used to be something that was utilized for healing. In Greek, they had healing temples for the dreamers. People that were ill were visited at night in the sleep chambers by a god, which unfortunately I cannot pronounce, even if I try, but that god then gave them specific medicine during the dreams. And it helped them, also the doctors or the the healers, to figure out as the patients explained the dreams to them what potion, what treatment would be the best for their condition. Dreams are something mysterious, and they have been revered in psychoanalysis or psychology, but they can also be on a very personal level, an inner compass, something that can really get us to maybe the next level or give us a direction. All of those things we're going to address in a moment uh, with my guest, Kelly Leidick, who wrote the book, the dreams or dreams that change our lives. It's a collection of stories and people that are sharing dreams that had a huge impact on them and what actually happened as they responded to the dream. Kelly is an author. She has a master in uh, writing consciousness. I believe that's what it's called or consciousness writing, or we got to talk about it in a moment as well, because (laughs) I actually haven't heard about this. So I'm curious to know what that means. She uh, has done a lot of things. She is also a Reiki master. She got a Juno award at the Amiga Institute. And she is the collector and author of this very fascinating book. So, well, thank you, Kelly, for being on the show tonight uh, and explaining more about dreams. Oh, thank you so much. And what a lovely, lovely introduction. I am so honored to be here and talk with you. And, you know, I sort of feel like what else is there is to say? Oh my gosh, (laughs) this topic is so big. It's so big. And um, there are so many different facets to dreams, as you mentioned, either the healing aspect or the psychological aspect or um, the emotional component. There are so many different ways that we could look at dreams. And I think that's part of the reason why I I feel so fascinated and have been fascinated almost my whole life because it's just so, it's such a varied landscape and it's so interesting. And, um, 
Yet, even when we think that we understand it, you're right, there's still an element of mystery. And I think that's what keeps the, the intrigue of the dreams and, and the continued study and research of dreams. We're always seeking to find a, a deeper and greater answer. Now, you obviously have been curious about dreams because I forgot to mention you're also a, a, a dream coach or a dream gateway coach or... Yep. something like that, which yep. again, I want to hear more about. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I wonder, are you always following your dreams? Are you every day writing down, okay, this is what happened at night? Or is it just random for you? I do follow my dreams and I have been following them since I was probably 14, if you want to believe that. And I've kept all of those notebooks. Um, and I haven't looked at them in a while. So that would actually be a very interesting thing to do maybe in the near future. Um, but I do keep a journal of all of my dreams and, you know, like my, like any other person, I guess, um, sometimes I remember them all and sometimes I don't, um, depending on what's happening in my life or, um, depending on if my schedule or my routine has changed or anything like that. And so that's something that occurs as well and creates some change. Um, but I do keep track of them and I notice that over time you can kind of see a thread of, um, the symbols and their connections to one another, it's almost like a bigger story is being created amongst these dreams. And so that's really fascinating to me too. Now, how did you explain what dreams or how do you explain what dreams are actually are about? You know, when you do yeah. some research on dreams, of course, you hear all different kinds of stories about, well, this is the brain doing some, you know, just digesting and working through the day, some say this is a call from the soul, some say there is some higher consciousness coming through, some say it's a yeah. subconscious working. How do you explain dreams? I think it's all of that. And I think each dream, and why it stays fascinating to me, is that each dream does have its own kinds of characteristics. And I think that some dreams are a dream of the higher self giving an important message. And I think some of it is... Um, just a simple daily processing, right? And that conversion of the short-term memory. But I also think that there's um, the opportunity to even look at if, if one believes in past lives and um, sort of other, other dimensions of reality. And I think that what I've observed over the years is that the dreams take on different qualities, if you will. Um, And even what Jung said about the, the feeling and the nature of the big dream, I think that many resonate with that. Many of the clients that I've worked with, if not all of the clients, resonate with this idea of the big dream, and I do as well. And so I think it depends on the context of the dream, and I think it depends on um, when the dream is happening and what is going on in the waking life. I always think that the dreaming life somehow mirrors the waking life, even if it's a subconscious story or even if it's the higher self coming in. I do find that there's connections between what's happening in the waking life and what is um, either processed or information that's given in the dream during, during that precious dream time. And so it almost works, I think, like a mirror in some ways um, when we look at the symbols and start to decode the greater meaning of the dream. Now, you say the big dream and Carl Jung, for the ignorance of us, explain what was that about? Sure. I think what Carl Jung really referred to is um, this feeling when you have a dream and you wake up and you come away from it feeling like something is different about it. Something has changed. This message that it's given you is important. Um, it's potentially Uh, shifting in your consciousness. It's potentially impacting the way that you perceive your own life and your waking life. I think any and all of those things could be considered what we would call a big dream. It just, it feels different than the ordinary dream space, which we would inhabit on a regular basis. And so I think a lot of times what happens is those big dreams are the ones that we stay, that stay with us. And we remember all of the details, um, For, for longer periods of time, it seems, because they have such a great impact, you know, not just in a visual way um, or an intellectual way, but also on that emotional level. Um, very, very visceral and very real and very important. So this is what your book is about, these big dreams that change people's lives. 
Yes. So this book, Dreams That Change Our Lives, um, is actually edited by the two Bobs, Robert Haas and Robert Gongoloff. Um, I'm not I'm not the author of the book, but I am a contributing author to it. And there are um, nearly 100 stories in this book. And they each are describing these big dreams, these dreams that have had an impact to change lives and, you know, giving maybe a lesson or giving some insight or some wisdom also that can be passed on to the reader so that when the reader is doing their own dream work, um, perhaps they'll look to these stories um, as a way of looking at their own symbols and their dreams and helping to support their inner journey and their process and understanding of themselves, essentially. Now, do you believe we have big dreams, but we just don't remember them more often? Or are big dreams always the one that we remember that, you know, knock us over the head in the morning and say, write that down? I, I think I have a tendency to believe that the big dreams are the ones that we remember. Um, I think it's more rare of an occasion that we wake up and we just we feel like something's different, although I think that that can occur. Um, I would say that it's probably a small percentage. I would mm-hmm. say mostly that the big dreams are those that we remember that have had or will have a profound impact of some kind. And so you believe these big dreams come from a higher consciousness or from a deeper part inside of us telling us something important about the next phase in our life? I do. I do. You know, I think I do. I consider myself more of a Jungian, although I incorporate other um, theories and beliefs into my coaching process. But I do believe what Jung said about um, the collective unconscious and sort of this vast pool of understanding, if you will, or um, kind of an underlying thread or um, dimension. I think there's many ways we can describe it. Um, but essentially, it's the, the place where we're all connected. And in that, we do have the ability to connect to what we would consider a higher consciousness or um, perhaps the core of a soul or a group of souls. Um, And I think that, yeah, I think we all have access to that at and during the dream time. I think that the big dreams can be both, though. I think that they can be accessing the higher consciousness or that collective unconsciousness. And I also think that sometimes the big dreams can be um, uh, describing or messages from our subconscious mind as well. And I think that those are important. one thing that we work through in the coaching process is also using dreams to uncover what Jung called the shadow, right? And that's essentially the part of your individual um, consciousness that you're not yet aware of or that's in the process of becoming known. And so I think that sometimes the big dreams can be part of working through that shadow consciousness that's coming through to have a big message um, for change potentially in the waking life. Now, After the break, I want to, of course, hear about your big dream and how it changed your life. When we come back, we will talk about that. Stay tuned. Perfect. Demystifying the journey on From Here to There Radio with your host, Diane Garris. Tune in every third Wednesday, 4 p.m. Pacific time on TransformationTalkRadio.com as Diane helps you get from where you are now to the life you envision. Get ready to get unstuck and move forward. Every show features a new special segment, New Age Notes, demystifying hot metaphysical topics of the day. For more information or to work with Diane, visit DianeGarris.com. Welcome back to Empowerment Radio. We are talking with Kelly Leidick, the contributing author of the book, Dreams That Change Our Lives. And I just asked her before the break, what was the dream that changed your life? Kelly, tell us. Yes. It still gives me the chills when I think <laughs> about it. Um, it's, it's so profound in its own way. Um, 
I, when I was going through the certification program for Gateway Dreaming, and that was um, hosted by a woman named Denise Lynn, who is just an absolute, the wonderful, wonderful woman and such a wise woman. Um, she put together this program and I entered the program really wanting to learn more about myself and then realized that I had um, sort of a, a knack for, for dream work. And in the process, we had to go through a series of um, different kinds of exercises and meditations and completions. And really, we were doing a lot of internal work on ourselves. And so it seems that through the process, it was kind of building towards this big dream, which was near the end of the certification process. And Denise had asked us, all of those who were in the program, this entire group, she had asked us to um, do a group dream, participate in a group dream, and not just a group dream, but a group lucid dream, which is really fascinating to me. And so she had asked that we, um, on a certain particular night, all together set the intention to dream together and go to a particular location. So on her property, she has a um, a walking labyrinth, um, something that that you can just use during the daytime or the nighttime to do meditation and contemplation. And what she had done is she had placed um, some objects at the center of this labyrinth. And so the intention of the group dream was that we all were to go to this labyrinth during the dream time, and then the next morning, report back what we had seen. So we set the intention as the group. We all went to sleep that night. And during the dream time, I was, it was almost like a flying dream, which is considered for the most part a lucid dream. Um, I kind of flew in to this labyrinth and descended onto the lab and as I got closer I could see other people around me I could see that they were also appearing to be flying Um, I continued to sort of zoom in and and aim towards the center of that labyrinth and when I got there I realized that there was a a blue bowl of water and some gemstones um, and some feathers and some other objects there and in the dream it felt very real and true and also very normal, which I think was an interesting dimension to that dream uh, because it just felt like I was supposed to be there for some reason. It was Mm. very comfortable like. And, um, you know, I hung out in that that center of the area of the labyrinth and I was talking with some other people there. And then when I woke up the next morning and conferred with the group, we learned that indeed the objects that Denise had placed in the physical labyrinth on her property near her home were the same objects that were dreamed about in that dream. Um, Everybody had the same dream or just you? um, I I think that most people had the dream going to the labyrinth. Some of, you know, some of the details had varied a bit, um, but a large, large percentage had reported back that they had seen the same objects and the exact objects that she had used. So yeah, it felt really profound because it was almost as if we were using, um, using the dream as a way to sort of pierce the veil, if you will, between the physical world and the dream world. And from that perspective, um, for me, I think it remains a big dream because that tells me that the, that the, well, first of all, I should say that the distance maybe between um, the waking life and the dream life is, is closer than we think, um, but also that maybe those two realms are not much different from one another as we would see or as we would understand them to be very separate. Um, that to me was kind of, the proof was in the pudding with that experience that, that there's a sort of a seamlessness that occurs um, between waking and dreaming life. And that really... It, it still stays with me to this day. Very, very clear in my mind. But that's like astral traveling. Some people would say you leave your body, you go out there and you see what else is happening while your physical form is in bed. Is that how you explain it? I think it could be considered astral travel. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, in the book, it does appear in the chapter in Lucid Dreaming. I feel that it has the characteristics of a lucid dream as well, because I felt, um, particularly when I was descending on the labyrinth, I felt like I did have some kind of control 
um, and that I was, you know, kind of thinking about what I was doing as it was occurring in the dream. Um, I think that with that in mind, I think that the lucid dreams and the astral travel overlap in a way. Um, now, I would what say do you maybe mean with lucid dreams. What are mm-hmm. lucid dreams versus other dreams? Mm-hmm. So I think that a lucid dream really comprises a dream that is directed by the dreamer. Um, in but not lucid conscious dream, directed. Yeah, in the lucid dream, typically people are conscious and aware, and when. Um, what they report is that when they think of something, it sort of instantaneously appears. Or if they, they like, like this labyrinth dream, are intending to move toward the labyrinth, there's almost a conscious process that's happening as the movement is occurring. And that's while seems you're to be sleeping. Character- while you're sleeping, yes. So it's not so that seems- conscious. I mean, it's a kind of different consciousness at work then. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think that astral travel can take on um, the same characteristics as lucid dreaming, but I also think that astral travel is is bigger than lucid dreaming. Um, And I feel that astral travel really encompasses more of um, a kind of an interdimensional type of type of dream or access, if you will. The most fascinating thing to me about dreams and and what you're saying and bringing up this topic about lucid dreaming um, is that when we sleep, and I'm sure you know this this as well, um, but maybe for some of the listeners, um, when we sleep, you know, the brain waves um, change, their frequency changes and they slow down initially. And then um, typically before an REM phase, the, the... frequency spikes and then it's it goes into what's called rapid eye movement now i know there's some more recent research that's saying that yes we dream outside of those rem periods and that's that's really more more um that's newer information or um, newer studies and research that's coming out but it, it was always thought that we only dream during these rem periods but what's fascinating to me is if you look at the frequencies of the brain waves during those REM periods when people are very actively dreaming, the frequencies are essentially the same as when one is awake. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, that shows that there's um, something, something else, something bigger that's happening there in terms of this seamlessness or this mirroring of the dreaming and the waking life. And I think that, that um, there's a correlation between that frequency, the higher frequency during that time and the waking life, because we do have some semblance of consciousness there. Um, and we do have access to um, more of the brain perhaps than, than was thought, or if we're in you know, the slower frequencies as well. So I think that the consciousness comes through in that way, for sure. Now, it's very interesting about uh, the dreams that change our lives because uh, I could actually have written a chapter in that book too because there was one dream that definitely changed my life, which was a dream when I had to decide whether I'm going to leave medicine and do something completely different, which was first going in research and now doing the things that I'm doing with uh, working with people on our subconscious level. Uh, and, and when I was in that decision phase, I had this dream of, of being in a, and it was maybe a lucid dream because it was very much uh, me at the center, me knowing what I was doing, me making a decision. I was in a slave ship and on that slave ship, I was kind of tied to that rudder that I had to row. And Mm. and I had that possibility to escape. And I was in the moment where the, shackles fell just without thinking jumping off board seeing there is an island and going to that island and it was an island where everyone was poor and everyone had just a little tiny hut and barely anything to eat but somehow they seemed content they seemed happy and and for me in that moment it was the freedom that I felt versus feeling locked in even though there was not a lot that I would say was prosperous, but it was freedom what I had. And, and the way, when I, it's, like you said, these dreams stay with you. So the way I interpret this yeah. dream was just simply that, okay, the old life feels imprisoned, even though it was yeah. prosperous and I had, you know, everything and more I wanted, plus the prestige of being in cardiology and blah, blah, blah. But the new unknown may have not had the same perks, but it had that one 
important perk, which was freedom. And yeah. also maybe a more simplistic or greater sim- simplicity about going about life than the the labyrinths that I was in before. So it was very, it was for me in that moment, and that's why I love your work, uh, just very clear, okay, I know what I need to do. And yeah. when we come back, I want to talk more about how can we trust our dreams more? Because a lot of people would say, you know, my dreams, sometimes they are making me be chased by something. Sometimes I'm uh, flying. Sometimes I'm feeling my spouse is cheating on me. I don't know. How can I really believe in my dreams? So what can we do to gain more confidence? And I know you mentioned this great feeling after a dream that is a big dream. But in general, is there a way for us to see dreams maybe as you know inner advisors that can help us a little bit along the way? So stay tuned. We will be right back with that. Hi, I'm Steve Kramer of Spirit Fire Radio, and I believe that meditation changes everything. It leads us in the direction of greater well-being, and that's a fact. I struggled with meditation for years. I understood the principles, but I found it hard to incorporate them into my everyday life. Spirit Fire's meditation practice changed that. It's called the Practice of Living Awareness, and it's taught in 14 steps. These are 14 tools that I can use in any moment, on and off the cushion. Steps like smile, flow, and ground of being support my clarity of mind while I'm navigating the ups and downs of modern life. That's why it's called the Practice of Living Awareness. If you'd like to add meditation to your daily experience, the Practice of Living Awareness is free, online, and it's suited for any level of practitioner. Visit spiritfire.com for more information. And be sure to check out Spirit Fire's meditation retreats in Western Massachusetts. It's all there at spiritfire.com. Welcome back to Empowerment Radio. Uh, we are here with uh, Kelly Leidig, and we're talking about dreams. And she is a dream coach. So, Kelly, just tell us quickly how do people get a hold of you if they want to work with you? Oh, sure. Thank you for asking. So, my website is just www.kelly with a y k e l l y l y d i c k dot com. And um, viewers and listeners can reach me at the email address kelly at kellylydic.com. Perfect. Now, I just, and this is maybe something you do in your coaching too, but I was asking you, so why is it that, or how do we use our dreams more as inner guides? And why can we sometimes not really distinguish between the dreams that we need to listen to, the dreams that are just basically the, maybe the garbage can of the mind, Uh, How do we figure that out? What would you give us as an advice to make our dreams a bigger part of our lives? Sure, sure. I I love that question. And I... I'm such an advocate. I feel that everybody should listen to their dreams and pay attention to their dreams. So I I love... um, hopefully to inspire people to do just that. Um, a couple of things I would say, you know, it's important to keep a journal first. And, you know, if you don't always remember your dreams, that's okay. I think that when you start to work with dreams and work with them more frequently and then start to remember, it kind of builds its own momentum because now it's almost as if the um, subconscious or the higher self is saying, oh, you're tuning in. Okay. Now you're listening. Oh, great. Perfect. So let's have a dialogue. So mm-hmm. I have a tendency to to notice that that's what occurs um, when I first start working with clients who are interested maybe, but um, haven't yet made the leap into making dreams a big part of their lives. So keeping a journal is really, really a good part of the process. I think that it really anchors your dreams into this physical reality. Um, and in terms of what you're saying, distinguishing between a day, what I would consider a daily life dream versus um, a metaphysical dream or a bigger dream, um, I think it, I think it just takes practice. I think it's about becoming more adept at um, looking at the symbols. I think it also comes with um, that discernment comes with maybe a little bit more self knowledge. Um, and once you start working with the dreams, as I said, and, and start to listen to their messages, and then 
acting upon them or, or using them as information to guide your waking life, I think that then it also builds momentum between the higher self or the higher consciousness and also the subconscious mind. It's as, it's as if everybody says, okay, you're listening now. So um, let's have fun with this. And so that's what I notice. It's like the more you dream, the more you dream. Um, you know, when you dig deeper into the symbols, I think that it can be helpful to to use a guide or to use a coach or a mentor who can um, stand back and be a little bit more objective, especially when we're working with big dreams or dreams that are emotional. Um, I've worked with folks who have uh, regularly recurring dreams. Of course, we can get into the topic of nightmares and what that means. Um, but if that's bringing fear, if dreams are... Um, a fearful part of your experience, um, then maybe it helps to have someone who can bring an objective perspective to the dream um, and create some detachment so that the dream can be worked through in order to gain the understanding that could come from sort of decoding these symbols, if you will. But is it like that people that say, I never dream? I mean, of course they do dream, but do they refuse to listen to their dreams? Do you feel like there is a is a block? What, what, what's the disconnect here? Yeah, I think that there can be, I think it's a couple different things. And of course, yourself, um, having your medical background, you surely know the impact of certain prescription medications on dreams. So I think that there can be a number of different factors that influence that. But um, a lot of times there is something on behalf of the dreamer that, um, Maybe it's, you know, an underlying or a deeper fear of looking at that content and that material, looking at themselves, essentially. Um, a lot of folks, you know, are afraid to do that because initially it seems very scary. And when we first start doing inner work, um, you know, what comes along with that is also taking responsibility for ourselves, which is sometimes hard for, for someone to do, particularly if they've been exposed to, you know, trauma for lengths of time um, or have had you know, particularly challenging experiences in their waking life. So it's a complex question that you're asking, I think. And I think that it also depends on um, the individual and their experience, you know, whether they're taking medication, whether they use drugs or alcohol is another important factor. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of, is the person ready? Are they ready to begin the inner journey? Are they ready to do some self-growth, some internal reflection, contemplation, and everything that comes along with that, which is, you know, that's a big journey in and of itself, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, I find it you know, working with clients that tell me that they don't feel necessarily they're remembering the dreams, that often it is also the client that is more in their heads, more connected mm -hmm. to their conscious mind, not really relying to their Know, on their feelings or not really mm -hmm. connected to maybe their more subconscious, subtle yeah. whisperings. And, and it's beautiful because it's also, like you said, when there is an, a, a willingness to listen, yeah. often the dreams come and often there is like, wow, my subconscious higher self, yeah. wherever it is, is uh, you know talking up a storm all of a sudden and uh, there are all these dreams coming up. So it's not like you can't change this, but it's also right. being willing to do that. But you brought up the fear. And I think that yeah. is really true that a lot of people do yeah. feel that there is a hesitancy to be aware of their dreams yeah. based on their experiences with nightmares. Now, what yeah. are nightmares and what can we do about them? I I love the topic of nightmares actually and I I love working with nightmares which probably on the surface seems very maybe morbid or um <laughs> odd um but actually I find that nightmares have um very very deep very meaningful information and content for the dreamer and if a dreamer can stay out of the fear right or um maybe neutralize it even, I think that going into a nightmare can, can really produce some very, very interesting results. A lot of what is at the core of nightmares, I think, is fear. Um, but also it can be, you know, something that's just stressful. Um, some people have dreams of being chased. Some people have dreams of um, like natural disasters, tornadoes and floods and things like that. And so 
we can see, you know, just on the surface that there's, there's a com- component or a thread of fear and all of those things. Um, but I always find that the nightmare is reflecting back to the dreamer something that they really need to know about themselves that is either um, creating a barrier to the next phase or level of growth that is, um, you know, fear as a blockage, it could be in that form too. Um, but that when we go directly into the nightmare to the heart of what that content is really about, it actually is a very, very liberating experience and um, serves to bring new information to consciousness and new self-understanding that can open up, uh, you know, a whole other world. So unlocking a nightmare can sometimes feel or um, be experienced like a big dream because it's almost as if we're getting getting beyond a barrier that's holding us back from from our next um, biggest greatest self or more empowered self um, or even uh, even just a perception of who we are as individuals as we reflect upon who we are. Uh, I do firmly believe that the subconscious is involved in our dreams and uh, mm-hmm. with fear and anxiety, especially. Uh, I find sometimes that the nightmares come up for people you know, right before they make a big decision, right before there is yeah. a change in their lives. It can yes. also be the subconscious saying, are you sure? The theme yeah. may be like loss or death or yeah. you know, being chased. And so yeah. what I recommend clients, and it seemed to work really well, is to mm-hmm. once you wake up you know, with night sweat, feeling like, oh my God, I have the worst dream right now. Right rather than sitting in it and feeling like, oh my God, you know, I don't like my subconscious. I don't want to go to bed anymore. Just really seeing this as, okay, the subconscious is asking you a question. Are you sure it's okay? Do you want to have that story really go this way? Or is there an alternative ending to it? And then just spending two, three minutes to come up with a different ending. Just rewrite the history of the dream. Rewrite the history of the nightmare. And, uh, and that is actually for many of my clients, then the end of that nightmare that may have been repetitive since years. It's almost yes. like, okay, now I get it. There is another doorway. There is another pathway. Yeah. And uh, so I think we can work with our dreams also in the conscious state. Or what do you believe? I believe that that's true. And, and some of the techniques that um, I would employ in a coaching session may look similar to, to what you're saying, rewriting the ending. Um, I sometimes use that too when I'm working with a client who has dreams of their past, mm. something that, that they regret in their past. That, that type of technique works really well with that too because I find that there is, um, you know, as we're talking kind of the intellectual component and then the emotional component too. And those are really pretty intertwined together in terms of the magnitude of the dream or the experience of the dream. And so if we can work with a dream on an emotional level, Sometimes that serves to unlock, if you will, unlock the block that the dream is presenting or the, that the dream is um, showing that we need to work with so that we can get beyond it. So I, I think that that's true. Yes. Mm-hmm. So don't be afraid of your nightmares. That's your message. Don't be afraid. Yes. Don't be afraid of the nightmares. <laughs> Hug those nightmares. <laughs> There's nothing Look scary at- inside of you. <laughs> Right, exactly, exactly. It's just another another aspect of of the self that is waiting to be loved and embraced. Now, you talked about the past. And of course, there is the past that is the past that we remember. Right. Then there are these past events that may have been buried and we haven't really remembered. And the subconscious and the dreams can also reveal those events to us. But then there's also yeah. past lives. So after the break, I want to talk with you a little bit about past lives and how dreams may actually reveal something about those. Now, whether you believe in past lives or not, now I used to be a skeptic, but my dreams, and there were several that I had recurrently, taught me differently. So when we come back, we'll talk about dreams and past lives. Stay tuned. Are you tired of being tired? 
Hi, I'm Mary Jane Mack. Did you know the adrenal glands, the workhorse of the body? They are the means by which you position yourself in life for whatever comes your way. Tiny but mighty, producing hormones the body uses to promote energy and vitality. These adrenals determine how you respond to stress, and when depleted, the body loses its ability to function powerfully when we need it most. The much-needed adrenaline or epinephrine is not available for emergency situations. Cortisone and cortisol, the longer-acting anti-stress adrenal hormones, can also become depleted due to the pace of our everyday lives. We overwork and undernutrition our most powerful ally that helps us to live the lives we desire. We are able to determine the optimum function of the adrenals and put your system back in balance. Contact us today to feel powerfully energized at 888-777-4232 or visit us at maryjanemack.com. Welcome back to Empowerment Radio. Have you ever wondered if there is a past life? And have you ever had a dream that is so different from that timeline that you're on now that you wonder, where does it come from? Now, I remember when, I don't know, five years ago, I dreamt that I was walking down the street, Cobblestone Street. And that street I walked down many times before in my dream. So that wasn't really something new. And it's that feeling inside of you that I know this place. I know this town. But you don't really know what name it has. You don't really know where it is. But you feel so familiar with it. And then you go around the corner and you see that tavern. And you just know exactly, oh, yeah, I ate this meal there and that meal over here. And and then in that dream... I came to my house, big door, I opened it, I stepped into the house, into a big like living room, but everything looked much older and everything looked more like antique. And But the fascinating part about that specific dream was that I stood in front of a mirror. And what I saw in the mirror was a guy with a beard and a big belly and a long red robe And I looked and realized it was me, but it was me, not now, obviously, but somewhere back. And it felt, you know, how a feeling can be a surprise, but it can be also a recognition. And in that dream, which I didn't make up, it was a recognition. It just felt like, oh, yeah, I remember that is my time somewhere in Italy, Venice, Florence. I don't know. But it felt very, very real. And when I woke up, I had a smile on my face because it made me just feel like a part of me was catching up or coming home. And so that was my experience that convinced me that there must have been more than just this lifetime. And so I'm just wondering about your uh, understanding of dreams and past lives. How, How do you see that? Oh, I love it. it. It's so fascinating. I feel like that's a never ending question. And as you're describing these red robes, I'm getting the chills. So I, I'm resonating with your description as well. So that feels right to me. It definitely feels right to me. The Venice, more of Venice is, mm-hmm. is what I feel than Florence. Mm-hmm. But um, I love what you're asking. And I think it's hard to say, and I think it gets very complex. And here's the reason why. We can look at dreams from from the individual consciousness we talked about earlier um, in our conversation, the collective unconscious, and then we get into you know these ideas or these theories about the sort of interdimensionality, which to me essentially means that there are you know multiple timelines. Now if we look at it from more maybe of a quantum level or quantum physics level, um, I do think it gets kind of confusing because from that point of view. Um, Time is obsolete. Everything is happening simultaneously. Um, we could potentially look at our past lives, if you will, as parallel lives. But if we're if they're parallel lives, that means that they're happening now. So I think that the conscious mind sort of gets confused about um, <laughs> <laughs> this idea of timelines, right? And then, of course, we have um, this newer research that's coming through that says our DNA is is actually um, holding consciousness and it has memories of the past or of our past lives, right? It's embedded at that core core DNA level. Um, 
But I think that when it comes down to it, it goes back to you. Jung's idea of this vast pool of consciousness that just simply exists, that's timeless, that we can kind of dip our finger in at any point or at any moment. And um, in doing so, we're getting information from it. So that's, I think that's why it gets confusing. So is there, a, is there truly a past, I guess, is really the, the question at the heart of that. And I can say, both yes and no simultaneously, which seems completely paradoxical. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do believe, you know, when you do tap, I mean, I often do past life regression in my work and uh, yes. what people experience seems very yes. personal. I know the concept yes. of that, you know, greater consciousness that, uh, you know, maybe commonality that we can tap into like a big pond of past experiences but that wouldn't necessarily feel as personal as right. it does for the people. And of course, you know, there is also uh, great work done by people that wrote books specifically, right. you know, many masters, many souls yes. and so on. So, well, it is an interesting topic, but what I'm, what I'm just wondering is with a dream in the past life, when there is a past life dream and we are assuming the dreams have a meaning, is it possible that that dream brings something from maybe a time back that, you know, an insight, a consciousness, something that we just need to also look into deeper and not just seeing it as an old movie that just popped up. Yes. Yes. I believe that. And, and I think what I was getting at with the paradox is that there's, there's sort of two levels functioning at the same time. And so sometimes it's, challenging to discern between them. So of course, I think we have the individual and that individual's past lives and um, what their DNA and their consciousness and and everything that's housed within them on an individual level. I do think that um, we have the ability, yes, to look into that on a very individual level. And then I also think that there's the the larger scope, which is that timelessness factor of of this collective. So I think it's absolutely possible that someone would have a dream and have um, information or even feel like they're reliving Mm -hmm. a part of their past life, um, which maybe would describe kind of what you were saying about the the dream of the the red robes and being in Italy. Um, That to me is, is an indication that there's um, you're, that you're kind of going back to it or that your consciousness is going back to that time and place, yes, to gain some kind of information that's important to you in this timeline and this life and in whatever experience is, is happening in this context of the now moment, right? Um, so yes, I think that's true. I think it's true. I think it's just a matter of, again, kind of working with dreams on a uh, maybe on a more deep deeper level so that um, that discernment, the skill of the discernment can be honed a little bit. And that way you can determine, well, when you say to yourself, is this a past life dream of mine or is this something else? Then it becomes easier to kind of decode it when, when mm-hmm. there's a greater self-understanding that's, that's been occurring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, there is that when you get a dream and you interpret it and you wonder what does it mean and you try to decipher but then there is also the intentional dream that you mentioned before in your uh, in your studies, in your course, where you went to the labyrinth and that was the goal. Is intentional dreaming something we can learn? Meaning, let's say, for example, oh, yeah. you are here and wanting to make a big decision, like at the time when I decided to leave medicine, or maybe it's about the spouse that you're looking for, or in general, just wanting some answer. And how would you go about that? How can you ask your dreams to give you an answer for wherever you want to be or wherever you want to go? I love that question. I love that question. And something that I do in my coaching, essentially with almost every session that I have with a client is the use of the, what we call the dream incubation process. And it's exactly that. It's either setting an, an intention with a statement. Um, for example, tonight I will dream of my past life in Venice, or setting the intention by way of inquiry and using a question to um, engage either the higher self or the subconscious mind in that dialogue to provide an answer. So for instance, you know, what, 
could be um, what uh, what would my next steps in my business venture look like, or um, how can I better um, tend to my health, right? Some, we use that when, when folks have maybe a health challenge that we're working on, getting more specific with what's going on in the physical body. Um, so there are many, many ways that the dream incubation process can be used. And um, I do work with clients very specifically in that way. And we use the question, the statement each, each session. And then for a period of about two weeks, um, a client would work with those statements or questions and then write down in their journal, um, just dictate what dreams that they had and what question or statement that they used when they were incubating um, as they had that dream. And then we would look at the relationships between um, the symbols of the dream and how it's answering the question or providing more information on the statement and what that then means to the waking life. Yes, yeah, so absolutely. And I do think that that... Um, builds momentum as well as we talked earlier that the more you use the incubation technique, the more you find that you remember. And the more you remember, the more you remember. And that just opens up um, just this whole other world that when we engage actively in this sense of dialogue um, with either the subconscious mind or the higher self, um, it becomes a very, very rich experience, almost like having... um, you know, like a mentor or a guide or a shaman who is, you know, holding our hand and shepherding us through this experience that we call life. It's, it becomes very profound, I think, when, when you really gain momentum with it and, and commit to the process. And I'm sure there is the critical part of our mind that says, why should I trust in my dreams? We're not told that uh, right. you shouldn't be a dreamer. And wasn't that a bad thing to be a dreamer? But as you probably from your work know, being a yeah. dreamer is in so many ways exactly what we need to be in order to make our lives the most whole, yeah. fulfilling, happy, and also in order to really go on our path, find our path, just uh, like I jumped yeah. ship and certainly found my yeah. path. Now, is there anything else that you would like to recommend to the listeners where you would say, okay, you know what, if you're interested in dreaming, besides contacting you at kellylydic.com, what else would you say is a great tool for people just to implement? Yeah. Well, as we mentioned, I think journaling is is an important process. I think also when someone embarks on, on kind of the journey of using their dreams, I think it's appropriate for them to take kind of a personal inventory um, mm-hmm. and assess their waking life. You know, what what are the expectations around their their dream life and what are they what are they looking to change? I think having a good sense of those types of things. Um is helpful to, to begin the process. I think there, you know, there are so many books out there, not just about dreams that change our lives, but, um, but other works as well. Um, the IASD, the International Association for the Study of Dreams is a, um, professional organization that I belong to and they're providing, um, not just conferences, but other research and information. So that's a really, really great resource that people can go to that website and, um, you know, just explore what is available through the IASD and some of their educational programs. Um, and I think just get curious, you know, I think that that gravitating towards those things that uh, an individual would resonate with or that feels right, I think is the right path typically, you know, following your intuition, following your gut and, and letting the journey unfold. Um, you know, there are many folks out there who are really, really versed in the topic of dreams who are teaching workshops, um, myself included. And so any of those things can also be great resources. And there are some groups um, that I've noticed also online that are dreaming groups, like in Facebook, um, you can use these groups and people share their dreams and discuss it. Um, So that could be a helpful resource for people as well. But certainly I think that... um, when when a person wants to embark on a journey, I think that it's helpful, you know, to have a mentor who can decode, who can mirror, who can look at the symbols and then reflect back to really, really dig in and do work. Because I think that dreams really do have the power to transform at a deep level. 
and have a profound impact on the waking life. And so that to me is where I get very excited and um, want to be supportive and helpful to those that I would work with or that I am working with because it's so exciting to see someone have that aha moment or to um, start practicing, you know, these new new tools and the new insight that they gain based right. on their dreams. So that part for me is is the exciting part as as a coach, but certainly any of those resources would be a really, really great start. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. And uh, I can only say this really proves the fact that all our answers are inside of us. We don't necessarily have to always look outside and run around. Sometimes just closing our eyes and take a nap and sleep, you may get more information than you may find on Google. So just yeah. allow yourself to dream, dream big, dream deep, but most of all, listen to your dreams. Until next time, I'm Dr. Schaub of Empowerment Radio. Goodbye. You've been listening to Empowerment Radio with Dr. Friedemann Schaub. Join Dr. Friedemann the first and third Wednesday each month at 11 a.m. Pacific as he addresses some of the most prevailing challenges of our daily lives. Discover how you can use the power of your mind to overcome stress, anxiety, and overwhelm and create a solid foundation of confidence and self-esteem. Learn cutting-edge tools so that you can approach every day with great ease, joy, and purpose. To learn more about what Dr. Schaub can do for you, visit the fearandanxietysolution.com.